Out of the milling unit, I want to take special steps to protect those margins and finish and create surface texture. This video will talk about that. Let's roll the intro. Step one is to remove the sprue. On a veneer, it usually doesn't fall off on its own in the milling unit, and if it does, you're in trouble. Usually it's gonna chip. I like the separating disc. That's on the JK03 lab kit. It's a center diamond. Grab the veneer when you remove it. Otherwise, it may fly across the room and chip a margin. So I'm gonna grab the veneer with my fingers, carefully separate that sprue. It's really quite simple. When removing the sprue, I prefer the shaping diamonds. There's a wheel, cylinder, and taper. I like the wheel. Make sure the wheel is spinning away from the margin and use light pressure. This wheel is designed to not hurt the ceramic. It's very tender for Emacs. It won't overheat it. Remove that sprue, stay away from that margin so you don't chip the margin. Our next step is to thin the margin. During the mill, we used a margin parameter to bulk that margin so it doesn't chip. You can see it was very, very, very smooth using the EF Burr system. I like the green coarse knife edge wheel. That's where we're gonna do our first stage of thinning the margin. We're not gonna thin it too thin though, and then you'll get those micro chips on the margin as you see here. Our final thinning will happen after crystallization. So our initial thinning of the margin happens with the green coarse knife edge wheel. This is where I prefer loops, particularly at my age. I have these beautiful loops and a magnifier. So it's my loops times two and a half. So I'm experiencing 13 to 14 times visual acuity on looking at those margins and they're really easy to thin because you can easily see them. The next step is to start the anatomy protocol. Primary grooves. It's good to understand what primary grooves are, particularly if you're doing one restoration. This restoration will illustrate what we want to do to match the tooth next door. Primary grooves are depressions in the labial surface. On centrals, there's usually two. However, they're like a fingerprint. They're different for everybody, but the principles are still the same. The techniques we're gonna go through is global shaping first. Now in the software, we can get most of the shaping we need. I do like a little extra ceramic so I have room to shape. My best milling unit though, is these two hands with the right burrs, the right system, the JKL3 burr lab kit provides those great burrs and my eyes and the vision of what I wanna do. We'll go in a very systematic order because here's the question, when are you done with the art piece? <laughs> Ask an artist that, when are you truly done with your art? If we take steps that are very defined, same steps every time, we can knock it down and get it done in a very short period of time and it's gonna look great. Most of my refined shaping is done with an 850 and an 882 diamond on the JK03 Meisinger Lab Kit. I may use either the 150 or the 880 based on the size of the tooth. So let's go ahead and get started with that shaping. The important thing is to look at the tooth next door and reflect on that same outline. I often will use a pencil to draw on the tooth where I wanna start my initial shaping and refine that shaping. Primary grooves are depressions in the labial surface. On centrals, there's usually two. However, they're like a fingerprint. They're different for everybody. One thing you notice on the sizal edge is that they're slightly rolled back a little bit. And so pay attention to that. When you're trying to match a tooth next door, it's a lot easier to do that. Particularly on the distal of this case, that incisal edge is quite thin and it's rolled back lingual. And most incisal edges are. So pay attention to that in your shaping protocol. While you're shaping, it's real important to pay attention to that emergence at the midline. That's the labial embrasure. Look at your restoration from the incisal edge. You want that emergence to be the same to the tooth next door at the midline. That's where we want close to a mirror image because that's gonna define that reflection on the mesial line angle. One thing interesting about this case is that the mesial distal width of this central is larger. The central was slightly retroclined, so we're bringing it forward. So there's more room to fill in with the ceramic. What we wanna do in a case like that is keep that midline pretty much mirror image. And you make up the difference on the distal. Maybe you roll the distal incisal line angle more around the edge of that tooth. There's a lot of ways to make it look harmonious. I'm not as concerned about symmetry with the mesial distal width. It's mainly the mesial of a central I want symmetry on, and that's mirror image. The distal, you can have some variety there, and it's gonna look really, really natural. We just want to avoid visual tension. 
Once we've completed our primary groove definition, then we're gonna to go to what we call texturing. This case is great for texturing because if you look at the tooth next door, it has all these little ripples. It's like ripples on a water on a semi-windy day. The technique I use for that is the end of my diamond. I find that a pencil grip is really advantageous for some of the refined texturing. It's more like a drawing technique and I'm, I'm really good at visualizing the tooth next door. And with that pencil grip, just kind of draw in and replicate what you see next door using different strokes. One of the things that I have found that works well for me is that whenever I scribe, particularly a, a more defined texture, always scribe and scrub, right? So you're gonna scribe and you're gonna scrub around what you scribed and that keeps it looking more natural. This restoration has a unique texture. When you look at the tooth next door in the midsection of that mesial primary groove, it has a look of water on a windy day. One of the ways I create that is I take the tip of the burr and I just kind of vibrate it lightly on that ceramic surface and it will create that nice effect. Now, whenever I'm creating texture, I have to think about how I'm gonna finish because you want more texture to allow you to finish either polish or, or glaze, or maybe both, because polish and glaze will neutralize the texture. So always think about that. It's best to emphasize your surface texture and subtract when you're doing your final finish with the, either the glaze or the polish, or both. For the anterior restorations, I prefer to fire them and crystallize them first before adding any characterization. In many cases, I may only place characterization on the incisal edge and polish in the rest of the restoration. Using thin margins, you're relying on the shine through of the tooth from underneath. That's the beauty of this technique. So in this case, what we're gonna do is fire the restoration with just object fix, no glaze on it, and then we'll come back and finish those margins and add our characteristics. Mm -hmm. 